Welcome back to First Up. It's nine minutes after seven o'clock this Tuesday morning, the 18th of October. Right now we focus on uh, an issue that's reared its head in Trinidad Tobago once again, and one we should be constantly focused on since it involves the safety of our children with the advent of the internet and the uh, proximity of technology and what it uh, affords our children. Uh, the issue re recently came to the fore with, with a high profile case involving one of the nation's uh, top schools in Port of Spain where uh, a teacher uh, allegedly uh, had relations with one of the students and, and subsequently a pornographic picture uh, of him ended up on the front pages of one of the, the daily newspapers in Trinidad Tobago. Uh, guest in this segment is psychologist Daryl Joseph. We want to go through it. Daryl, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome, Daryl. Uh, the uses and misuses of social media and the internet. Uh, more and more, uh, I, I, I read a news report yesterday indicating that uh, Sesame Street's website was hacked. hacked and pornographic material uploaded deliberately mm -hmm. to Sesame Street's website, which is carefully contained. It was a deliberate act to expose children to pornographic, hard, hardcore yeah. pornographic material. And there's a caption on top of all of the videos that says, don't kids love porn? Question mark, mm -hmm. which means you, you understand the, sick, the, sick, yeah, the psychology. The yeah, so, Sesame Street's YouTube side, I should say. YouTube so it, it, it lets you know that, that the, the, the threat is there. Mm -hmm. And dealing with the internet and how our kids are told of the appropriate use of the internet is critical. Yes, okay. Well, first of all, good morning. Um, Paul, good morning. Jesse May and Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks for the opportunity once again to be here. I really enjoy doing this. Um, what we have to understand is social media. And by social media, we're speaking about Facebook, Twitter. Those are probably the two most popular right now and others. What they've done is that they've revolutionized the way that we communicate with each other, okay? And with any revolution, the rules change. The way that you would have communicated prior to the revolution is different from the way you communicate after. So people need to understand how the rules have changed and adapt and adjust accordingly, okay? In re relation to the incidents, there were a couple of incidents last week. You mentioned one there, there was another one. Um, what happened there, <clears throat> excuse me, behind the veil of internet coverage, people are a lot more bold and feel a lot more empowered to do and say things that they wouldn't ordinarily say face to face. The reason that this happens is because a lot of the non-verbal cues that are used during communication are absent. I'm speaking about body language, I'm speaking about tone, volume, and so on. If I were to deliver, I'll, I'll give a simple example. Paul, if I am telling you, Paul, I'm really interested in what you have to say. And if I say, Paul, I'm really interested in what you have to say, it's two completely different messages there. And when you're communicating online, that non-verbal information is lost. Even through video connections? Absolutely, even through video connections, all right? Now, in addition, there is a, we know that a lot of, happens often to younger people, okay? Um, sort of a rebellious kind of a streak going on with them. They want to prove society wrong, they want to prove people wrong, people who are telling them how they should behave, how they should conform and so on. Uh, so there's a rebelliousness going on and people are using, like in the instance of the, the video with Sesame Street, people are using the internet as a means of demonstrating or a means of venting their rebelliousness, their, their lack of, um, the, the, wish not to conform with society and not to do things, not to play the game according to the rules, so to speak. So you find that sites like that will be targets for people who ordinarily may walk around and behave very normally and you know you may not even know that they have a uh, tendency towards pedophilia. But because of the veil of the internet now and you know the, the, the secrecy behind it, these people now feel they have a chance. I'm just, I'm just curious as to why someone would stage their protest in such a manner and attack a site of that nature, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Sesame Street has been loved the world over. Mm -hmm. Everyone understands it as a powerful educational tool for youngsters. Yes. Um, why attack that? I mean, what is the message behind that attack? And why use that material, yeah. you know, for to this, attack it? For the same reasons that you just cited there, because it's well loved, because everybody knows it and because it will create a big furor, a big scandal, it will have a big impact. When persons want to, okay, we, we don't understand a couple of things. We don't understand the, 
the mind of someone who's, in, who's involved in, in pedophilic activity, all right? We need to understand the mind of somebody who is in the internet, or a hacker, so to speak, persons who go about doing this, all right? The challenge is in the hack, okay? The challenge is to break into the site because um, I can't think of any examples offhand, but I know there have been occasions where they have arrested persons who hacked into websites and they interview them after. And a lot of these young, young guys, you know, bright, bright, intelligent, okay, young guys. And, you know, they always seem to express this sense of remorse and this sense of shock and, you know, they didn't expect it. They didn't really mean it the way that they are. At least that's what they say, all right? And we have to take things at face value. So the, the intent behind the action is really to demonstrate, look, I can break this, I can put this up, I can get this out. I'm better than you. Something like that. Yeah, something well, I, I like want to go back to a, a comment you made earlier on about the fact that the internet and social media interaction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has brought about different rules Absolutely. in terms of, of interaction. Is it a generational thing? Because even though my generation uses the internet, most of my generation, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong with this assumption, is less likely, we are less forthcoming. There, there seems to be, from what I've seen, the younger generation live their life openly yes. on social media as yes. opposed to a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, or a 50-year-old yes. who is more judicious in the information they share yes. on the internet. Is that a, a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah, actually, and you know, it, it goes down several levels. I was reading something the other day and it was saying, I might be a little bit wrong, but it was saying something like this. 50 and over still pick up the telephone and call, all right? Um, 40 to 50 email, okay? Then 30 to 40 might use um, something like um, uh, something like Facebook or something like that. And then when you get to below 20, you're talking about instant like BBM, BlackBerry Messenger, or not Twitter. advertising for them, or but, Twitter, but, but or things even, like even that. With, even when different generations use the social Facebook, yes. because different generations do use Facebook, yes. uh, much to the chagrin of the younger generation, yes. they, they still <laughs> interact differently. The, the, the amount of information shared Absolutely. by a 15-year-old, they live their life, they, they get mm. engaged, they break up, they, mm. yeah, everything, they, they have everything. terms. So I'm recently widowed if they break up a relationship. Play by they, play. they put all their dirt out there. Mm -hmm. He did this to me, she did that to me. Mm -hmm. And without any... any uh, no, because intimidation at all. Remember, I said at the beginning the rules have changed. Okay, so the way that young young persons, um, 20, 25, and under, so on, the way that they communicate and what's normal for them is very different from my generation or generations gone by. Uh, you have to understand something as well. Huh? Over the last, I would say, 30 to 40 years, technologically, we have gone through more revolutions than any other period I think in the history of man. We've had, I mean, things that you and I would have grown up with. Uh, I, I talk to my children about things like cassettes and record players now, but, and they, they don't even understand that. Have families kept up with this, given, given the dangers that it poses? Mm -hmm. have, have family, no. has, have family life kept up with this? Because now, no. with that, comes inherent dangers. Absolutely, yeah. So, so now, I mean, I don't know what the situation was regarding that situation in, in the school, because, I mean, the, the person has since resigned. Yes. But I, I have to ask myself now, how are families and by extension, educational institutions to deal with these situations. Yes. Because if we are to believe what is out there in the media, mm -hmm. th that would have been statutory rape, if indeed that yes. took place. Yes. And that's a frightening situation. It is extremely frightening. One of the biggest mistakes that um, parents, adults, institutions make is by mentally distancing yourself, distancing themselves from understanding the technology. Now, it is different from what older persons may have grown up with. But telling yourself or saying things like, you know, I don't understand the young, them young people thing, no? Or, you know, I don't have a computer brain. You hear people saying things like that, all right? Um, they need one to of, stop it, doing it's that one and of make the, the biggest effort. mistakes, yeah, because it is like, you know, you can talk yourself out of doing things. And when you hear yourself saying things, there's a sort of a subconscious programming that takes place that actually makes it harder for you to achieve what it is you want to do, all right? It's really not all that difficult. I have worked with adults, older persons, and so on, you know, showing them how to use PCs, how to use computers, and it's really not all that difficult. And one of the biggest mistakes we make as adults is by telling us, is by creating a sort of an invisible barrier between ourselves and the children and the youths and what they are doing. We need to understand, parents need to understand what their kids are doing on their computers, okay? And I'm thinking again about the infamous episode that happened with um, Granny. Remember that one? Yes, and, right? Granny Akina. Yeah, yeah, right. Parents need to understand, educators need to understand what 
children are doing and what they actually can do as well. And the only way you can do that is by taking some of your precious time and involving yourself in what's going on. Now, I don't, don't take that the wrong way. I don't mean involving like what the good gentleman did last week. I just mean <laughs> involving as in understanding the technology and understanding how it works and what's done and so on. When you say involving yourself in what's yes. going on in your youngster's life, how do you draw the line between becoming obsessive and oppressive and also uh, engaging and, and engaging in proper oversight and being, you know, a healthy guide? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, another one of the big problems I, I have noticed we have with parents in these days is that we um, parents to a large extent, tend to abdicate responsibility for things that really should fall under their level of responsibility. So setting rules with respect to internet usage, what you can do, what you can do. A lot of parents take a very hands-off approach with respect to that, and they say, let the children do whatever it is they're doing, okay? If your child has, if you, okay, let's say you have a, a child who is preteen, for example, and that child wants to have a Facebook account. Now, I'm not even recommending that they should, okay? But you need to have some kind of access to that as a parent. Your child can't should, be just running about, you know. Should or uh -huh. how much privacy should a, a child have? If, is privacy an issue at all? And, and is there mm -hmm. an age differential as the child gets older, more privacy is allowed? And, yes. and how, 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 how mm -hmm. does that work? Mm -hmm. How should that work? Okay, all right. Um, we have laws in the country with respect to who is considered an adult and who are the privileges that are allowed an adult and, and so on, okay? Um, even years ago, going back to, you know, tr traditionally, there are certain places or certain things that a teenager is allowed to do at a certain age. And, you know, instinctively, culturally, we've been sensitized to this over the years and we know it, okay? But for some reason, when it comes to internet usage, we throw those things out the window. So I will not allow my daughter to go to this party or whatever it is because she's underage, but she's on Facebook in her bedroom whole night. God alone knows what she's doing, who she's talking to, who is talking to her, who is checking her profile. And all of the computers now are coming with built-in cameras. Yes. So that you can actually have a live conversation yes. through some software. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's very you know. easy. Com it's and perform as well. Conversation, conversation and is a light Perform right. as and, well and, and let, me get to that, let me get to that part. Very good, Jesse. Um, the performance aspect of it. The, a lot of parents and don't know how, how pervasive that is and how much of that is going on. Because you know, things like, okay, for example, Skype. All right, very popular program out there. Everybody has high-speed internet now, okay? And this has made video calls, where you're seeing video and free. audio through Skype, which is free. It's made it a very, very normal thing. And you leave uh, a person, uh, you leave an underage person behind a closed door, outfitted with the latest webcam and, and, and laptop mm -hmm. and high-speed internet. God alone knows what they could be doing and who could be seeing it and what could be happening. And, and who could be taping it because the person yes. could be remotely taping you and you're not, and you're not aware of that. Yes. They because they do come with that record feature. There is software, if, even if it doesn't come as part of the standard package, there's free software. And understand that the internet is a very free place. There are people developing programs all the time. So there's some, there, there are lots of programs that have to do that. To what, what should parents do? regarding their children's use of the internet and interaction with social networking sites. Because I, I, I know of a, a parent who insisted that his daughter, mm -hmm. he have access to his daughter's Facebook account, mm -hmm. only to find out two years down the road. She has another one. That she has three others. Yes. She has three others. Yep. So he was checking one, yes. which had very little the safe traffic. One. The safe one. Mm -hmm. And she had three others. Right. Do not, do not, do not allow your children to have computer usage behind closed doors or even in a part of the house where you cannot see uh, what they are how doing. How is that possible when a phone is, is on Facebook and is that you buy a cheap phone and low-tech phone for your child? Why? Isn't that? What is wrong with that? A telephone is supposed to be for making and receiving phone calls. If you are buying a phone for your school-aged child so that they can be on Facebook and Twitter, you need to check yourself. You're doing something wrong. There's no requirement for a child to be on Facebook or Twitter. Would you advise a parent to allow their child to be on Facebook under 16 or 17? Under 16? No. There can be exceptions. You have to know your child. All right? And you should always, as I was saying, be able to monitor what your child is doing. If you have a laptop, for example, that they use, and um, I need to say something here. Um, the, the laptops that have been graciously distributed to our nation's school children, 
the 11 plus candidates and so on. Parents need to be very wary and very careful of what their kids are doing on these laptops, huh? Because children are very smart, and when somebody figures out how to do something, the message is passed on very quickly. It's spread. We've got to take a short break, Daryl. Yes. Uh, just want to say a special good morning and hello to our listeners on Talk City 91.1 FM who have just joined us. Yes, Did Bangladesh, cut our tail. Did we lose? Uh, so that's why Talk City <laughs> has joined us this morning here on First Up. So welcome back, Talk City listeners. Uh, thanks for being a part of First Up. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more with psychologist Daryl Joseph. It's a very interesting discussion here this morning and eye-opening too. Don't go far. Seven twenty-seven. Welcome back to First Up. This Tuesday morning, we're talking to psychologist Daryl Joseph about the uses and misuses of social media and technology by our children. Uh, before the break, we had a question about the balancing of parental locks and, and supervision mm -hmm. over the trust issue. Yes. Right. How do you balance that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, you do need to trust your children, but your children need to understand that that trust is also earned. It doesn't just come just like that out of thin air, okay? So you demonstrate that you are responsible in little things and you are allowed more. You demonstrate the opposite and activities will be curtailed. So as I was saying before, re you, you cannot keep up with the children in terms of their knowledge of technology and the latest thing coming up, the latest hack and so on, but you can restrict access. So don't tell me you have a 10-year-old child and you bought an iPhone for them for Christmas because I will have to probably restrain myself from doing something that might get me in trouble. That is going to get me very, very angry, because very that's annoyed, very upset. For a that is very as much highly as love nonsensical. Your child, it's yeah. extremely irresponsible to give your child an iPhone, which is high-tech, has um, all video sorts of interaction, it has too mm -hmm. much, it, it's too high-tech. Yeah, it's all not sorts safe. of access. Right? The same Skype we were talking about with the video calls and so on, you can do that on, a, on an iPhone. Yeah, so you, you don't can. have to have a laptop you somewhere. Can you can go in any little phone. space with this thing and you can do whatever mm -hmm. on it and nobody has to know except who you want to know, all right? So um, smartphones, as we call them, iPhone, Blackberry, and so on, those are for adults. Those are not for children. Those are not for little kids. Should you be checking your children's, if you do decide to give your children access to various accounts, Twitter, Facebook, should you be checking those accounts? Yes, you should. You absolutely should. I'm very, very serious about it. I'm very, very strong on that also. And the thing I was saying earlier on about restricting access. So if they're using a laptop, for example, you have the laptop in an open part of the house where you can see the screen. If you're in the kitchen, if you're doing work or whatever it is you're doing, you can see the screen. It can't be that um, everybody's over there where you all are and I have my laptop here like this. I'm, yeah. well, I'm just doing homework, right? No, it has to be turned and open and exposed so that mommy, daddy, whoever, all right, can see what's going on. You do not give them the kinds of telephones where they can communicate through Facebook and Twitter and so on like that, right? So you restrict access. The schools are doing it as best as they can, okay? The adults, parents, caregivers need to do the same thing. It's as much as you can do at this point in time. Where do our schools need to go in terms of dealing with possible pedophiles, statutory rapists, mm -hmm. uh, do, should we be doing psychometric testing on teachers now? Uh, I don't know. Absolutely. When I'm seeing a teacher do, doing... Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, psychometric testing is one of the things that I do. So, of course, I will champion it. All right? And while it is not, you know, no test is 100% foolproof, you can find a lot of people who may have the ability to do those kinds of actions, criminal actions, through rigorous testing. I have but seen it myself. In addition to the testing, though, mm -hmm. and um, yes, you may go through that sort of extensive testing when you want to get the job, yes. but even after you've been in the job, um, there is an argument that it should be done, if not annually, you know, every, periodically? every, uh, yeah, periodically, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, especially if you, if you, if you want to, you know, go up for promotion or something like that, yes. that you need to have that sort of psychological testing done on you. And in addition to which, uh, a comprehensive background check needs to be yes. done on the people Absolutely. who we're going to whom we're going to expose our children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I do, okay, listen. When I do testing for for various things, huh? sometimes people want to apply, for example, for a, a firearm license. All right, okay. The procedure involves the written test, which is usually done online. It involves one or more clinical interviews, which is an interview usually with myself, all right? Where it's not, not a normal counseling interview, it's a clinical interview, so I'm looking and probing for certain things. And there are background checks done with persons, at least three people, who have known you for some time. 
and all of that information is put together and then you can come up with an idea of you know your impression of the person one or the other alone will not do it you need to be that complete and that comprehensive if we take that now there are some forward-thinking companies that do that sort of work right now and I commend them for it but there are many others that don't go to that length they think that that is um it's too expensive or it's too much effort or it's too much necessary. time. Very, very sad because the amount of money you're going to spend afterwards for damage control, for counseling, for help, for all sorts of different things, it far outweighs doing the work up front. Given that young teenage girls and boys mm -hmm. are during especially adolescence and in some cases even at, the ten, at, at very vulnerable stages of their lives, very impressionable, yes. what sh signs should parents and or school supervisors be looking for if a, an underage child becomes sexually involved with an adult, mm -hmm. there are certain behavioral changes that we can look for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen when they can hide it. We see changes in them. Some we choose to ignore, yes. but they start to act differently. That's right. What should we be looking That's for? That's right. Okay. Um, very important that you, I, I've said this before, that you know your children. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, it's very important that you get to know them beyond their name and their address, all right? So you get to understand how they normally behave. All right? And it may require a bit of education that might be beyond what most teachers know, but you have to understand how to look at behavioral cues and how to understand what is normal for a, a child. A what person, would be right? abnormal then for, yeah, right. well, I'm, for I'm, a young girl starting to yeah. have uh, illicit relationships yeah. with an, an, an older adult. Illicit relationships implies the, the young person knows that they're doing something wrong. All right. Well, they're legal so usually, I think yeah. they, they may not understand the ramifications of an older male having sexual no. relations with a teenage no. girl, it's but, statutory rape. Right, but they usually become somewhat withdrawn. They usually become somewhat guarded. Um, you may find if you ask personal questions that they try to deflect those questions as quickly as possible, all right? Which is why I said it's important to know your kids because if you don't know the children and you know, just out of the blue one day, ask, how are you going, how things, and they just, oh, I'm good, everything is fine, everything is all right. You're not gonna know that there's a difference, okay? So you must have a benchmark beyond, you know, so that you know the difference, right? But, so, but when you uh -huh. say they become withdrawn and they become guarded, it mm -hmm. may not necessarily be that they are being abused uh, by no. the person no. in the sense that, you know, it may have started out as a bit of hero work and then they just naturally fall into this relationship mm -hmm. inappropriate as it is with this person yeah. and they think that they're madly in love with this person yes. and and then they become secretive sly yes. almost yes 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 so you look for those things you look for that um, a greater sense of you know urgency to be secret and to, to hide things and to as I said to sort of deflect personal questions and personal conversations. Mm -hmm. If there, there may also be changes in the person's grades, there might be changes in the person's uh, attitude in the classroom, for example. Dress. Yeah, the way that they dress, the way they carry about themselves. That's why I said it's really important to observe and to know, know the child. Because if, you know, you have this kind of, with, with, you know, relatively, you know, serene type person, all of a sudden, everything out and they're strutting about and, you know, carrying on and behaving in a manner that's very different from the norm. That might be a flag that, you know, something is going on there and that needs investigation. Should we have sexual offenders registries in this country. A friend of mine recently moved back and she was shocked that there's very, very little access to information about yeah. possible sexual offenders, given yeah. the fact that where she lived in the US, she could go on the internet or she could go to town hall yep. in any city that she lived mm -hmm. and find a list of possible people who are living in the area who've mm -hmm. had history of pedophilia Absolutely. or sexual offenses. Absolutely, I'm very much in favor of that. I think that's something that should be implemented here. Yeah. But why aren't we why aren't we understanding the importance of implementing such laws? But then the, the other the other aspect of it is is enforcement in this country. So, well, I don't know. The implementation um, is one thing, and or legislation is one thing. But then there's the the lack of enforcement in several areas. So it yeah, gets frustrating. Um, I don't know. I have to try not to become frustrated by the things you're talking about because if I become frustrated, I can't work. <laughs> All right. But um, I've, I've asked the question of myself several times, why is it that we are so reactive to things? Why is it that we have to wait until things blow up, become disastrous, before we act? Now, I was very pleased to hear the Minister of Health, um, I think last week sometime, he was addressing World Mental Health Day, and he was saying you know, that we need a greater awareness of mental health and the importance of it and so on. Now, I was really glad to hear him saying that, but I would love to see the action behind it because as I've said time and time again, the state of mental fitness of an individual determines the way they think and ultimately the way they act, what they do. When a person is bad driving you on the road and, and, and cussing people left, right and center, they're not handling their stuff well. They're not handling their stress as well. They're not handling their life well. But we continue to put, you know, this, this sort of 
cap on or put these blinkers on to tell us, you know, no, we don't need to pay attention to that. That's just for those people who mad and on the streets and sort of thing. And when something dramatic happens, then we rush in, or we carry them for counseling, and we're making counseling available. You would not believe how I hate to hear that, no. We're making counseling available Absolutely for the fact. victims. We don't need counseling for the victims. You need counseling now. <laughs> so that you don't become a perpetrator and so that nobody becomes a victim afterwards. And, and speaking, speaking of counselling. Yeah, yes. as, you, as you talk about um, you don't become a perpetrator, mm -hmm. um, we also need to put systems in place to deal with those who perpetrate these types of acts. Yes. Uh, because there is also something in their past that may have impacted them to, to behave in such a manner. Absolutely. Um, you know, okay, we, we have a number of therapists in this country, all right? Do you know in Trinidad and Tobago, you cannot study all the way to doctoral level. As a counselor, as a psychologist, as a counseling psychologist, you still have to go outside of Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And we've been speaking for years about tooling our population to deal with our unique needs and our society and what we need and so on. And you know, we have gaping holes in the kind of work, the kind of help, the kind of you know, assistance that we have available for people out there. Yep, that's so true. That we've run out of time. Of course, you've got to come back. We continue our mental fitness chats. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about what the school should be doing regarding the, the students. But of course, they should provide counseling for all the students and advice all the time. because it could have gone to other students. And adequate, not one person yeah. for 10 schools. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've been talking to psychologist Daryl Joseph. We'll take a break and come back with our friendly neighborhood friends of the Unitrust Corporation. Stay with us. This is First Up on CTV.